Namaskaram everyone. In this video, I shall be discussing about the latest guidelines on the use of probiotics for the management of pediatric gastrointestinal disorders because a number of brands of probiotics are coming into the market and people are advertising the same in different conditions. So let us see what the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition needs to say about this. And this article was published in the year February 2023 in the Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition. So probiotics are increasingly being used in the pediatric population, but a lot of uncertainty persists as to why and what kind of probiotic should, be, should we use in which kind of situation. The effects of probiotics sorry, are also considered to be strain specific. So we need to know which strain to be used and not to be used in which specific state. The recommendations which are mentioned over here, they say are broadly applicable. They should not be viewed as the only management, rather they are the preferred management. And ultimately the decision depends on the individual clinical scenario. So coming on to the recommendations, there are three kinds of recommendations which have been given, three situations. First, in which a definite recommendation has been given. Second, in which a particular probiotic is not recommended. And third, in which no recommendation, neither for nor against a particular probiotic can be made. Like in acute gastroenteritis, one may recommend lactic-casey bacillus Ramnosis, GG, in the given dose. One may also recommend Saccharomyces boulardii in the given dose, Lymosi lactibacillus ureteri in the given dose and the duration, and a combination of Lacticaceae bacillus rhamnosus and Lymosi lactibacillus ureteri in the given dose and duration. Why? Because reduced duration of diarrhea, reduced length of hospitalization and reduced amount of stool output has been noticed with these probiotics. But due to lack of efficacy, one should not recommend the combination of Lactobacillus helveticus and Lacticaceae bacillus rhamnosus in acute gastroenteritis. What is also a surprise to me is that one may not recommend Bacillus clausi strains O, C, Sin, N, R, and T because these are present in a popular brand. Now, if the use of probiotics is considered in any patient because the patient might be at the risk of developing antibiotic-associated dysbiosis because of the presence of such risk factors like the class of antibiotics, the duration of antibiotic treatment which is prolonged, younger or older age, the need for hospitalization, comorbidities or previous episodes of antibiotic associated dysbiosis. In that case, one may recommend high doses of Saccharomyces boulardii and Lacticaceae bacillus rhamnosus GG started simultaneously along with the antibiotic treatment. So generally we think that antibiotic and probiotic should not be given together. But in patients with who are at risk of antibiotic associated dysbiosis, both should be started simultaneously as per Espergan. One may recommend Lacticaceae bacillus rhamnosus for the duration of hospital stay for prevention of nosocomial diarrhea in children in those who are at risk. But one should not recommend Lymosi lactibacillus ureteri due to lack of efficacy for the same. One may recommend Lacticaceae bacillus rhamnosus or a combination of Bifidobacterium infantis, Bifidobacterium lactis and Streptococcus thermophilus TH4 in the given doses. But due to insufficient evidence, no recommendation can be made for or against Lymosi lactibacillus ureteri or the combination of Bifidobacterium bifidum and Lactobacillus acidophilus in prevention of NEC. Also, healthcare providers may not recommend Bifidobacterium brevi 
or saccharomyces boulardii in patients with for prevention of NEC due to lack of efficacy. Now, in patients with H. pylori infection, along with the treatment for H. pylori infection, one may recommend Saccharomyces boulardii for increasing the eradication rates and decreasing the gastrointestinal adverse effects. No recommendation can be made for or against the use of any probiotic in patients with inflammatory bowel disease that is ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease due to insufficient evidence. Now coming on to the functional GI disorders. Functional GI disorders as we know they are also known as disorders of gut brain interaction and these disorders are of three types infantile colic, functional abdominal pain disorders and functional constipation. So in infantile colic one needs to know that no recommendation can be made for or against the use of any probiotics. However, one may recommend Bifidobacterium lactis for the management of infantile colic in breastfed infants. No recommendation can be made for the use of L. Lamosi lactobacillus ruteri in formula fed infants and one may recommend Lamosi lactobacillus ruteri for the management of the same in breastfed infants. So, one may recommend Bifidobacterium lactis and Lamosi lactobacillus ruteri in breastfed infants, but the same has not been recommended in formula fed infants if at all required. However, no recommendation can be made for the use of any probiotics in infantile colic. This is the summary of this scene. In functional abdominal pain disorders, one may recommend Lamosi lactobacillus ruteri for reduction of pain intensity and may also recommend Lacticase bacillus rhamnosus for the same in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. One may not recommend the use of probiotics either as a single or as an adjuvant therapy for the treatment of functional constipation in children due to lack of efficacy. In celiac disease, no recommendation can be made for or against the use of any probiotics. In small intestinal bacterial overgrowth also, no recommendation can be made for or against the use of any probiotics. So, to summarize, one may recommend Lacticase bacillus rhamnosus, Saccharomyces boulardii, Lamosi lactobacillus ruteri, and a combination of Lacticase bacillus rhamnosus and Lamosi lactobacillus, Lamosi lactobacillus ruteri in patients with acute gastroenteritis. One may recommend high doses of Saccharomyces boulardii and Lacticase bacillus rhamnosus GGG in prevention of antibiotic associated dysbiosis for those patients who are at risk, one may recommend Lacticase bacillus rhamnosus GG or the combination of Bifidobacterium infantis, Bifidobacterium lactis and Streptococcus thermophilus for prevention of nosocomial diarrhea in children at risk. One may recommend high doses of Saccharomyces boulardii along with the therapy of H. pylori infection and one may recommend Lamosi lactobacillus Ruteri for management of for pain reduction in patients with functional abdominal pain disorders. What is not recommended is Lamosi lactobacillus ruteri for prevention of nosocomial diarrhea, Bifidobacterium brevi or Saccharomyces boulardii for prevention of NEC, a combination of Lactobacillus helveticus and Lacticase bacillus rhamnosus in acute gastroenteritis. One may also not recommend Bacillus clausii strains OC, SIN, NR and T due to insufficient evidence as per the Esbaghan guidelines 2023. And one, may also, one should also not recommend probiotics in patients with functional constipation. Also, no recommendation can be made for or against the use of probiotics in the following conditions like Lamosi lactobacillus ruteri or the combination of Bifidobacterium bifidum and Lactobacillus acidophilus for prevention of NEC. 
lactic acid is rutary in prevention of or treatment of infantile colic in formula fed infants or the use of any kind of probiotic in patients with inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis Crohn's disease celiac disease and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth syndromes so this was the summary of Espaghan guidelines on the use of probiotics in children given in the year 2023 i hope it was up to your expectations thank you so much for a patient listening and watching and please do share the knowledge thank you